really since being a teenager I've always thought that Le Mans is perhaps one of the most important and romantic and dramatic races in the world. And from being 16 years old I used to make a pilgrimage to the proper Le Mans um, back, back in the day. And um, of course there I actually saw a P3 Ferrari uh, running there and it remained perhaps the um, most iconic and wonderful car in my mind ever. So as far as the um, P4 is concerned, um, I um, was lucky enough my father's best friend had what is probably the only completely original P4 in the world. That car still exists and I'm lucky enough as a young man to have actually sat in the passenger seat of that and um, been driven in it. So. I guess there aren't many people who have been lucky enough to do that and that together with seeing the car compete at Le Mans um, put it in my mind as a must-have car. Unfortunately there is only one original P4 proper one in the world, it was my father's best friend's and the car now lives amazingly in um, Vero Beach where we have a house on the ocean and it lives just four miles away from there and the man's got his own six mile race track he's built in his garden in order to run it. Needless to say it's fairly wealthy and it's not for sale, read my lips right under it is not for sale. So really from being a teenager that drove um, the, the, the desire to have a Ferrari P4 probably more than anything else. Uh, what I did notice at, at the race was that the car that won its class was driven by a man who went on to be a really good friend of mine, a, a guy called Peter Suckler, who, who was um, a private racing driver who was wealthy enough. He'd been at Ampleforth School in Yorkshire, he knew all the right people, and he was wealthy enough just in those days to go out and buy a Le Mans racing car and go out and place with it. Uh, unbelievable, <laughs> can you imagine that happening today? But anyway, Peter came, Peter won his class in the 275 GTB4 Ferrari uh, at, the same, at the same event that the P4, um, in fact, won it. And so that car also became one of the must-have cars for me. And because they made a couple of hundred of those, I've got a nice original one of those. Unfortunately, my P4 is something that was built up by a Ferrari collector in Texas who's become very famous and he put together three or four of these P4s um, from original bits, but one or two new bits, but I guess that's as near as I can get. To me, it's one of the most amazing and wonderful cars ever, um, but I think I totally accepted that, like a GTO, it was something that I would never, ever buy. I was aware of the fact that the original one was up the road from me in um, America, and that it belonged to someone who wasn't about to sell it. So I'd sort of given up on the idea of a P4. Um, but interestingly, I was at a concourse in a place called Amelia Island, which is a wonderful um, concourse for mainly from, well, no, actually, it does go up to things like P4 for hours. Uh, and it's in northern Florida, um, southern Georgia, every year. Well, great thing if any of you are going to be in America in April time, you should go to the Amelia Island concourse. It's fantastic. And I was there and um, I was walking around the stands there and I came across a model of a B4. And it was the most magnificent model you've ever seen. It was sort of so big and absolutely perfect. And it was expensive. You could have bought, you could have bought a small brand new modern car for the price of this bloody thing, but it was fantastic. Anyway, I got chatting to the, the man who owned the, the stall. In fact, it turned out I, it was a Brit and I knew him anyway. And I laughed, I said, you know, this is an absolutely amazing model, but I said, the only person who's going to pay this sort of silly money for it is the man who's actually got it. And I know he doesn't come to Amelia, so you're tough out of luck, I said. I said, I think this car needs to be like half price. So he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, you can have it for half price, provided you promise me you will buy a real one. And I said, well, I said, that might be a tough promise, but if I said I'd do my best to buy one, do I get it at half a price? So he said, yes, you do, and we shook hands and we're still friends. We um, looked around the world and we couldn't find anything that was anywhere near good enough. Until suddenly, James, my son, spotted 
um, just what we wanted, but in Dubai, of all places. So um, nothing, nothing ventured. We, um, we made a trip um, out to Dubai and went to, we went, in fact, we went to test the car was the idea and um, see whether we liked it or not. But of course, we arrived in Dubai and it was sort of like 120 degrees and the showroom was in central Dubai, <laughs> the heart of traffic. So in the end, we couldn't actually test drive the car. It was just totally impractical to do it. Um, but it was magnificent. It was absolutely indistinguishable from, from the car that I'd grown up knowing when I was a kid. You know, oh, bloody marvellous. So anyway, so I bought the car and we air freighted the car from, um, from Dubai straight to America. And it went to Arizona to um, a shop there that specializes in cars like that and I gave it to them for a month and told them to do things to it, call me when it was ready and then I flew out and test drove it for the first time in Arizona. My particular car was put together 30 years ago by this fellow Norwood in Texas and it was put together for um, a, a, doctor, a medical doctor who, who lived uh, just outside Chicago who was racing a short wheelbase Ferrari, a proper 10 million pound competition short wheelbase Ferrari. And um, despite being 50 something, decided that wasn't fast enough and he really wanted to be 14. So he knew this guy Norwood, and Norwood's quite famous because he still holds the land speed record for, uh, for a road car at somewhere like Daytona Beach. And it's something like 268 miles an hour in a Ferrari road car much tuned by Norwood, but Norwood is held in great respect across America, although um, he's not like a saw, not as young as he was. Um, but he, he, he said to this um, doctor, he said, well, I'll, I, I will do it, but extremely difficult. I, you know, it's probably one of the most difficult things I've ever been asked to do. And to do it properly, we're actually going to have to make the engine from scratch because um, the original engine is a, is a V12, quad cam v12 uh, amazing absolutely wonderful piece of work and whilst um and there have been a number of replicas quite a number of replicas built with something like 412 road car ferrari engines in them and um, he said you know we're going to do this and we're going to go racing he said we got to do it properly so we will make an engine from scratch well cost of making a v12 quad cam engine from scratch on a one-off basis you can imagine i mean um, I say probably as much as a brand new Lamborghini just for the engine. But anyway, he said they would do that, but only on return that he was allowed to share the racing. So the, the doctor being thinking the way I would think said, yeah, absolutely, Bob. He said, you know, I'd be delighted if you'll build the car for me at cost plus 10% and share the racing, we have a deal. So Norwood said, that's fantastic. That's one of my, you know, love, love to do that. And I'm pleased to say I've had Norwood on the phone several times and talked to him about this car and what I've done with it and so on. And he's a very, very enthusiastic guy. So they finished the car about 30 years ago and they went out racing it with the Ferrari Owners Club in, in, across the States and, and they won. My God, they won, they won, they won and they won. You know, fantastic. And to be fair, the car is a little bit more powerful than, than the original P4 was. I think the original P4 had something like 360 brake horsepower. Uh, this has got something like 480 brake horsepower at the rear wheels on the rolling road. And of course the car's not very heavy either. So it's quite an amusing thing to drive, as again, you guys have found out. Well, the first drive, in fact, was when it went to the shop in Arizona, and I went over and spent a few days uh, driving it. Um, and then we got a, another rally that we were doing the other side of the States, which we went to. But um, we arranged to take it on the Going to the Sun rally to Montana. Briefly, that's a rally of about 1,800 road miles over four days, uh, and it runs across Montana. Well, of course, for those of you who don't know, Montana is one of the mag 
most magnificent states in America, um, known for its mountains and its wide open roads and its lakes and its fishing and its horses. What an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place. So there is a, a highway called the Going to the Sun Highway that's very famous in Montana. And this rally takes its name from that and we do at least part of the Going to the Sun Highway as on the rally. So we, we arranged to have this car trucked from Arizona um, up to um, an, an area of Montana about 200 miles away from the start. Again, another interesting story. I don't know whether any of you have seen that wonderful um, film, um, The River Runs Through It, which is about fly fishing in, in Montana. And we actually, I ended up, I had a friend who actually now owns the ranch where all that film was shot. So he invited me to stay for a couple of nights before the start of the Montana going to the sun. So that was fantastic. But we had the car actually delivered in a truck to, to this guy's house, uh, which was 200 miles from the start of the going to the sun highway. So we dropped it off, much to the amazement of the local ranch hands, got in the car and drove the thing all the way to the start of the going to the sun rally. Absolutely fantastic, what a great start. And then we went ahead and did the whole 1800 miles. The car is, as you probably heard, embarrassingly noisy. And um, whilst quite a lot of people were pleased and gave me the thumbs up, there was at least two women who told me what an effing person I was for making this dreadful noise. And at least one whose baby was probably changed for life. So I apologise to her if she's watching this. As I grew up, I became very friendly um, in, in my 30s with a man called Nigel Dawes, who some of you people watching this will have heard of or know even. Uh, he lives at a, 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 a moated house in, in near Chateau Impney, uh, one of the few moated houses in the country. An amazing, interesting guy, incredibly artistic, incredibly keen on cars. And he, um, many years ago before I had many really good cars, had some amazing cars. So he had a, an original D-type Jag, and he had not one DB3S Aston, but two. He had a, an open, um, an open, uh, an open customer's car, and he also had one of the very rare fixed head coupes, and of course he had that D-type as well. So he had a really naughty habit of inviting me down for a late breakfast once a month or so, and um, we'd have we'd have a leisurely breakfast, and then we'd take one of the cars out and share driving it and he had a load of other wonderful cars too, but just talking about these three cars. So I actually got to put serious miles on a, an original D-Type, an original DB3S, a production car rather than a team car admittedly, uh, and this DB3S team car, which was a fixed head coupe. So I was able to judge um, which of those cars I thought was the best. And like Sterling Moss before me, and I smile because I <laughs> don't compare myself with Sterling Moss, but. Sterling Moss famously said that the DB3S Aston was the greatest sports racing car of the 50s of them all. Um, he thought it was, um, it was smoother and, and more uh, felt safer to drive than a, than, than a D-Type. The great thing about those two English cars, they were, they were Le Mans cars. And the thing about a Le Mans car is it's built to go racing for 24 hours. I mean, that says a lot. And whilst the, the, the comparable Ferrari, the Testarossa, was possibly an even nicer car to drive, it's a much more fussy car than, um, uh, than its V12 rather than, than a straight six. And damn it, it's Italian, not British. But um, So I came to believe that a DB3S is what I really wanted. And again, I did it from the experience of spending a few hours driving, driving the real thing. And I was lucky enough um, oh, many years ago now, probably 12 or 15 years ago, to um, buy the car that you've been driving um, from uh, an amazing guy who was actually called Aston, Clive Aston, who ran a jeweler's shop on, um, on Bond Street in London. Wonderful, wonderful enthusiast. And um, I, when I went to see him, the car had been parked up in his garage for something like 12 years and never been out. And I rang him up and I was a friend of um, another guy called Everard who had been a very famous racer of DB3S's in, in period. So I rang him up and said, I tell you what, I'm a friend of, um, of Tony Everard's, could I come and um, buy you lunch? So he said, absolutely fantastic. 
And by the end of the lunch, she'd sold me the car. And he said, um, he said, I've been waiting for somebody to turn up and who I liked and thought would use the car, and I would sell the car to them for virtually any price that they asked, uh, that they named. He said, I've had a wonderful time with this car of mine. It owes me absolutely nothing, and I'm so pleased that you're going to have it. So we shook hands and. That was the DB3 Sport 15 years ago. I think it's true to say that the that 50s sports racing cars are some of the most iconic and wonderful things that you can drive. I, I, I know a lot of our fellow members of Supercar um, are very much into modern cars, McLarens and Ferraris and so on, and they of course are absolutely wonderful and far more effective in getting from A to B than the DB3S ever now will be, but of course the DB3S is an old car now. Um, and these 50 sports cars are at a wonderful period where there were no, no driving aids, uh, whilst the DB3S has, has a, a kind of a limited, slip differ, diff, a limited slip differential. It doesn't really um, work particularly well and it certainly doesn't have anti-lock brakes. Um, the DB3S was one of the first of the cars to have disc brakes, that and the D-Type both beat Ferrari to it and had disc brakes in 56. Um, which um, gave them a great advantage going racing and makes them a wonderful road car. So this 3S, as you'll have experienced, is, is wonderfully torquey. You can put your foot down at 100 miles an hour in top gear and the thing lights up and goes. And it also has the most wonderful brakes. The brakes are the most marvellous thing about it. Bugger the ABS, bugger anything. Just don't push them too hard in the wet. But the car accelerates and slows down into a gap in a way you just wouldn't believe. And you. It would take driving something like a McLaren to behave like that uh, with, with, with almost any other car. And yet, this is a car built in 1956, more years ago than even I can really count. For me, the, the whole point of having these cars is, is to drive them. I do get a lot of pleasure from knowing they're in the garage, and just occasionally I go and, and gaze wistfully at them, but not very often. I, I am fairly busy and I travel the world, so most of my pleasure is enjoying them. So this DB3S, geez, really, what have I not done with this DB3S? So uh, it's done the Colorado Grand in America, which is probably the greatest long-distance endurance rally in the world, uh, not just in America. Uh, started by a wonderful friend of mine many years ago, uh, and lovely really it was set up a, as a charity to raise money for um, police officers who'd lost their lives uh, working on the job so we um, we, we make probably a hundred thousand a year towards the, the um, these widows and, and orphans of the police people and we we put put their children uh, through university if needs be we, we, we take care of everybody who's died uh, in action in in, um, Colorado, in the Colorado Police Force. In return for that, um, they provide an escort uh, for us throughout the rally. So imagine when you're cruising 110 miles an hour with a police bike in front of you with the lights flashing, and then the guy comes has dinner with you at night. I and mean, It's absolutely wonderful. So it's done the Colorado Grand, the, one of the greatest. There were several other um, wonderful uh, things to do in America, which, which I've also done. There's a wonderful rally in Montana go, called Going to the Sun Rally. It's done that. Um, it's, done, it's done the Arizona Copper State as well. It's been out to South America and been to Patagonia and done the Patagonia Melee there too. Uh, and finally, it's driven from Seattle to um, Pebble Beach, 1,800 miles through the Oregon Mountains and down the West Coast Pacific Highway onto the lawn at Pebble Beach, visiting amazing uh, people's car collections and things on the, ro on the road and having a great time on the road. And then back home, um, it's um, won several of the Aston Martin Owner Club competitions um, over the years. And um, it's a regular competitor, as a number of you will have seen at Chateau Rimpney. 
Yeah, it's some, an interesting point, this question of, of the relationship between the value of cars and, and whether you use them or not. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm not particularly pleased that the value of these cars has gone up as much as it has. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, I would rather that they, they didn't, hadn't gone up so much and then I might have had even more. Uh, there's one or two cars like the Ferrari GTO, which whilst I had one when I was uh, 24 years old for a mere six weeks or so, um, I know I'll never have one of those again. And um, so I'm not pleased that the value's too high, but they're all very well insured. And of course, the thing is with these cars that um, you can rebuild almost anything for a million quid. So um, if the car's well enough insured to, to cover a million quid's worth of fixing, and I'm not sure I'd like to have been in the car if it needed a million quid's worth of fixing, uh, then actually there's nothing to worry about. I mean, the only thing you have to worry about is the car being stolen and not recovered, uh, which is a concern of mine, uh, although there are various um, things that people like me do to make that unlikely to happen. Uh, the biggest worry of all of them is fire. If you if you ha have had a, a, a catastrophic fire, that would be terrible. So as you look around my uh, cars, you'll see every one of them has a, an absolutely up-to-date, powerful fire extinguisher in with easy reach of the driver. Uh, and they they live in a uh, in a building with with automatic sprinkler systems that that um, empties the oxygen in the air as well. Uh, in order to protect against that. But that's really the only thing I worry about. And of course, the daft thing is that um, probably the biggest risk is that there's a fire or worse still, a, van, a vandal attack in, in, um, a, in a garage. They're actually a damn sight safer on the Colorado Grand at 120 miles an hour than they are sat in a bloody garage. Mm -hmm.